Already in rehearsals for the Tonys. How's it going? It's going to be a fucking disaster. <laughs> it's, um, <laughs> just it, like I don't know. It felt like such a good idea, you know. When you say like, I'd have been so angry if they'd have asked anyone else to do it, and now I'm like, oh no, this isn't. This is really because it's live and it's. Uh, it just means so much to me to do it. It means more. T I, 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 I don't think the, you know, the theatre wing would be able to find a host to whom it would mean more this year, right now. And uh, I don't know. It right, always suck it, Neil Patrick Harris. It's over <laughs> for you. No, he'll be, I hope he'll come back next and year. One of the things that's become a kind of a signature for your show was an idea that you came with, Carpool Karaoke. Yeah. <laughs> And when you started that, people didn't quite get it at first? Nobody wanted to do it, is that right? Um, well, it, look, it was hard to put people on our show full stop, like, is the truth. <laughs> it was, I mean, genuinely, like, it was, it was a difficult thing, and I understand it, I get it. Like, publicists would just go, well, we don't know this guy. He might be really mean. I'm not going to risk a client. We'll, we'll wait, we'll watch it for six weeks, and then we'll see. And we were just very, very aware that we didn't have six weeks, that we didn't, we didn't have uh, the luxury of an audience who would stick with us through a rocky start. Like, we knew that we had to hit the ground running and go, this is our show and this is me and we'll be here every night, you know? Um, and, very, and lots of our friends from the UK were great to us, people like... You know, people like David Beckham or uh, One Direction or, or um, Gordon Ramsay, Simon Cowell, people with nothing seemingly to promote were like, yeah, we'll come, we'll, we'll help, we'll, we'll, we'll dig in. And, and that started to help. And then with regards to the carpool thing, I mean, like I, I have to say, I, myself and, and Ben Winston, who's the exec of our show and is producing the Tony Awards, we... We, but we have never felt more sure of an idea. Once we got it, we were like, oh my God, it's great. That's and it. I sort of very, very naively and bullishly thought, people are gonna love this. <laughs> and no one would do it. Like, no one at all, like zero. So uh, it was just a chance meeting with Mariah Carey and we, with it was someone, someone from her label rather. And we showed her a clip of me doing it on a sketch that we'd made for Comic Relief which is my character from a sitcom I'd read, and we were, I was singing songs with George Michael in a car. And uh, there was just something very joyful about it. And, and we were like, and she saw it and showed it to Mariah, and Mariah, like, in a world where no one had the balls to do it, went, yeah, all right, let's do it. And she was amazing. Without her, it just wouldn't exist at all, period. And... Uh, so we owe her a lot, and it's also very, very thrilling now when we get to say no to the people who said, <laughs> said no to us a year ago. You know, there is an intimacy about them. There is a, an intimacy about, like, I, I just, I think you could, you could see Adele on a hundred talk shows, and you, and you won't see that side of her, and that goes for Justin Bieber, as it does for Stevie Wonder, as it does for Elton John, like, there is an intimacy about it where people's, they're, 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 it's not that their guard is down, it's, that it's very, very different in the same way that if you and I were chatting here, it would be very, very different if, if, if you guys weren't here. There is, a, there is an intimacy to it, which, um, which I, 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 I'm, very, I'm very, very proud of because lots of people talk about it in terms of the songs, which are, of course, these joyful and lovely and sometimes moving moments, but what... I'm equally as proud of the interview within them because I think any way you can show an artist, particularly when it's uh, Elton John or, um, or, or, you know, or, or Stevie Wonder, someone who have been interviewed by a hundred Rolling Stone magazines or, or any of those things, that, that, that there is an intimacy there for their fans, for people who are interested in them, to see on TV or when it's like Sia or... You know, you could have Jennifer Lopez on a talk show 
25 times, she's never going to send Leonardo DiCaprio a text <laughs> on her phone. Or in fact, we did one the other week with, we did like a Best of Broadway with uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda and Banks. And there's a bit, there was a bit that we, we, actually had to, we actually had to cut just for time, really. But there was a moment where Lynn told me, and I, I've never read it and I've never seen it anywhere. Lynn told me that um, You'll Be Back, the song You'll Be Back in Hamilton, uh, w was given to him by Hugh Laurie. When he was on, he was doing an episode of House and Hugh was asking him what he was working on. He told him about, he was writing this, sh this sort of hip hop musical about Alexander Hamilton and he was looking to write a song that King George would sing. And Hugh Laurie went, ah, yes, you'll be back. <laughs> and he just, apparently he just said in that moment, he was like, he heard it and had it and went home and wrote it. And you're like, oh, that's amazing. And like, we didn't have, we didn't even have time to put that in, you know? Right. What if Hugh Laurie is behind a lot of things? <laughs> what if Hugh Laurie is behind you right now? <laughs> I dare you to look. <laughs> Now, I want to talk a little bit about your start because we know you're a Spice Girls fan, but I also understand that you, have, you started out as a kid wanting to be a performer, and you said that one of your earliest memories, correct me if I'm wrong, but your earliest memory, you were four years old, it was your sister's christening, yeah. and you got on, on, you know, you were placed on a chair or something to be able to see it better. Well, we, we grew up, I grew up in the Salvation Army, um, which is, you know, quite a weird organisation, and um, no, and, um, <laughs> and uh, my younger sister was being christened, and we went up onto the platform, and uh, I couldn't see because it was godparents and things around. So the uh, the the sort of the, the priest, the Salvation Army officer, grabbed a chair and said, "Here, are James, stand on this," and I I can remember it. I remember it like, like it was yesterday, really. I remember standing on this chair, I remember looking out at the congregation, which was probably, it was probably like 30 people tops. It felt like 3,000. And, uh, and I just started like doing silly things and people were laughing and I like turned around and put my head between my legs and people laughed again and I was like, oh, so this is great. But that's not the thing I really remember so clearly. What I remember really clearly is when it had finished and we went back into the congregation and I was sat between my parents staring at, you know, someone's back. I was like, oh, this is boring compared to it up there. Oh, you've got to get back up there at some point. That's, that's where it's great. And that, and that was it, really. That's, and how old were you? I, was, I would have been four at that time, yeah. I would say, on average, probably twice a month, I would go up to London, audition for something and not get it. And at, at, at the time, it could be very, very demoralising. But I'm, I'm so grateful for that rejection now. Because the truth is, the only thing that separates an amateur and a professional, the job is the same. You're learning lines, you're saying them, that's it. The thing that separates a professional and an amateur is rejection. It's being told you're too tall, or your ears are too big, or your eyes are too weird, or you're too fat, or too short, or any of those, it's hearing those things and not giving up. If you can cope with that, then, then you can do it, you know? And I'm so grateful that I didn't go to drama school and come out feeling like, oh, I've already played Hamlet. And then be like, and then you're so demoralized as an adult when you, but when you're at school, it doesn't matter. It's not like you need to pay rent. And so I'm very, very, grateful for that time really and I would get like the the two pages with a scene where I'd be like the guy who drops off a tv to Hugh Grant or <laughs> like a news agent in something and I was like and I really remember thinking oh I thought oh and I realized that all of these decisions were being made only on the way I looked that that well you look like this so you will play these roles and then eventually you'll work your way up to like a bubbly judge in something. <laughs> and, uh, and I remember thinking, oh, I always thought it would be, I always thought I'd get a chance, at a, a seat at that table where I could see all of these lads who are my age all just sort of, oh, there's a chair, please. Ah, Mr. Hiddleston, come sit down. Um, and you sort of go, oh, I, and I thought, right, and, then, and that's when my, me and my friend Ruth just thought, well, why don't we try and write something? Why don't we write a sitcom? And 
we sat down and we, we wrote a show. Uh, I was from England, she was from Wales. I had a story that my best friend Gavin had, had done. Wow, didn't know he had any plans. <laughs> We're not as close anymore. And, um, <laughs> he, uh, and he had met his girlfriend a certain way and we got talking and we, we wrote a script on spec. We just wrote it and then we gave it to the BBC and they said, they, we, they didn't even, we didn't even write any more episodes. They said, when did you get back from Broadway with the History Boys? I was like, we get back in September. They said, right, we'll start shooting this October 1st. So you realised early on that you were going to make your own best opportunities? No, I just thought, I'm not, oh, it became clear to me that the path was not open in the way that I wanted it to, in the way that, it just that, that, that I just thought, oh, okay, you, you don't have a divine right just to be offered the ch No one's going to come along and just say, here's a great role for you. And I'd, I felt very lucky in the work that I had done, but it wasn't moving the needle at all. And that's why writing something and, and actually doing it, and there's a tremendous, you know, all your choices are half luck, but that, that was a real lucky one.